just want to say there are copies of our book for people who come up. So for those of you in the back row, hello, hello. The books are in the front if you'd like a free copy. Come on up. I'm looking at you. <laughs> Do you want a book? Come on up. They're up here. So front row, here, plenty of seats. Thanks, thanks for coming up. Can you make me a host on Zoom so then I can mute the guests? Oh, good. And, and did you need to record it? Oh, you want me to record it? You can if you'd like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? All right. I am so excited to introduce our speakers today, Purnima Vijay Shankar and Karen Catlin. They are the co-authors of the book. For those of you who have not moved to the front, I'll, sh I'll vana it. <laughs> Present A Techie's Guide to Public Speaking. Uh, but what they're going to talk about today is not just limited to technical people. I think of it a little bit like ratatouille, you know, where anyone can cook. Anyone can successfully publicly speak. Uh, so, uh, Pornia and Karen have extensive bios, so I thought I would just give you a couple of highlights. Uh, so, Pornima is the founder of Femgineer and is an avid public speaker who talks around the world on topics ranging from engineering to entrepreneurship. And she hosts a monthly web show called Femgineer TV. She's been an entrepreneur in residence at 500 Startups. That's the name, 500 Startups. <laughs> not, not at 500. Right. <laughs> and a lecturer at Duke University's Pratt School of Engineering and the founding engineer at Mint.com. Karen is a leadership coach and an advocate for women in the tech industry. She earned her leadership stripes as a VP at Adobe Systems. And in 2015, the California State Assembly honored her as the Wonder Woman Tech Innovator Award for outstanding yeah. achievements <laughs> in business and technology. <laughs> Forgot it. <laughs> and for being a role model for women. So without further ado, I think we're in for a big treat for Nima and Karen. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Olivia. So I remember the exact day when I decided to embrace public speaking. And it's not like I had never done any public speaking before that exact day. I had had a 25-year career building software products. And I started out as a software engineer. And as Olivia mentioned, over time, I moved into executive leadership. And I most recently was a vice president of engineering at Adobe Systems. So I certainly did some public speaking during that 25-year career. I had to present my work at you know, stand-up meetings and then run my all-hands meetings, occasionally speak at an industry panel or conference. But I have to tell you, I did not enjoy it. I don't think I was very good at it. I'd get stage fright, like some of you that I was talking to before. I'd get that stage fright, that nerves, and I pretty much would say no or make excuses anytime I got an invitation to speak, because I just didn't want to do it. But that all changed on this one day I'm talking about. And this one day was about four, four and a half years ago. And it was at a point in my career where I had decided to pivot, to pivot away from building software products to now being an advocate for women who are working across tech building those products. And I was getting advice from a mentor about how to build a business around being an advocate for women in the tech industry. And we were on a walk, my mentor and I, in the hills above Stanford University, walking around the dish, if you're familiar with that. And she was giving me some advice and so forth. And at one point, she asked, hey, Karen, do you do much public speaking? And oh my gosh, all the stage fright that I'd felt during that first 25 years kind of just hit me like a ton of bricks. You know that feeling right here? It was awful. And I started thinking inside my head, no, I don't do much public speaking. No, I don't enjoy public speaking. No, I'm not good at public speaking. No way I'm going to do more public speaking. No, 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 no. It was just the soundtrack that was going on and on in my head. But I didn't say any of those words out loud because I realized that the reason she was asking, hey, Karen, do you do much public speaking? 
is because it could be the key to unlocking this new business, this new career I wanted to pursue, to sharing my perspective of being a woman in tech, to getting new coaching clients for my business, and so forth. So instead of saying the no, 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 no that was just spinning in my head, I simply said, you know, I need to do more of it. So that was about four, four and a half years ago, and I set a goal for myself at that point to speak in public once a month. And I kind of just had to have like the opportunity to practice it, had to have like almost shock therapy to get over the stage fright. And I'm happy to, very proud of myself and to share with all of you that I've pretty much hit that goal every month. I think my busiest month, I spoke six or seven times in one month, and I've even given a TEDx talk in that time. And I have come to love public speaking as a result. I'm a little bit of a geek about public speaking now, and I'm just thrilled to be here today to share some tips and strategies with all of you. Now let's hear about Pornima's public speaking journey next. So growing up, I was one of those shy kids, and around middle school, I figured that life was going to be pretty hard if I didn't do something to change that. And so in the most awkward years of my life, I decided to sign up to my school's speech and debate team. And I'm really glad that I did because it helped me do things like ace my college interview and then go on to you know, ace my first job interview. And of course, later on, do more complicated things like raise capital from investors here in the Valley, recruit for companies, and you know, get out there and speak much like Karen when it comes to advocating for women. And so I'm really glad that I invested that time early on because it really helped me throughout my career and it also benefited my companies. Now, Karen and I met about four years ago. We were seated next to each other at a ladies' luncheon hosted by Andreessen Horowitz, you know, the big uh, VC firm. And we started talking about what we were working on. Karen mentioned she was leaving Adobe to become an advocate for women in tech. And I mentioned how I had previously been the founding engineer at Mint.com. I was now taking my blog, Femgineer, transforming it into an education company to help techies build products and companies in their careers. And so we started brainstorming how we could work together, how we could collaborate. And one of the themes that kept emerging was this idea behind public speaking and how it had really benefited us in our career. We kind of considered it this multivitamin. So we started teaching some workshops, we developed an online course, and then we decided that we really wanted to scale our effort, and we put it all together into a book. Maybe you're too far away. Yeah. Oh, no, it's just, it's on. Yeah. Oh. We need to switch clickers already. <gasps> Let me just yeah, go ahead. check it out. Zoom is the top thing. Ah, uh, okay. It's okay. Great, thank you. So we decided to put it all into our book, Present a Techie's Guide to Public Speaking. And today, what we want to do is we want to share some of the most popular tips and strategies from the book. Because you probably heard that public speaking can be really valuable for your career, but what exactly does that mean? And then as Karen mentioned, you know, you might have some nerves, some stage fright that's holding you back from even getting up and speaking. So we'll tackle that by sharing a couple strategies around it. And then for those of you who might be thinking, you know, I'm not exactly an expert. I don't have anything earth shattering to share, or I'm brand new in my role or in my career. Why would anybody care about what I have to say? We'll show you how you can extract your expertise. And then we'll dive into some more advanced topics around how to engage audiences through storytelling and we will conclude by sharing a couple of war stories from our recent past so that you see that we've been through the trenches and that we're still up here presenting in front of all of you. So let's get started. All right, so you've probably heard that when you speak in public, you know, doors will open and you'll get all these opportunities, right? Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, the thing is, when you speak, when you share the projects you've worked on or the products that you've shipped, people take notice. And you get to control the message. You get to be as authentic as you want. And as they notice, they want to go on to champion your efforts. They might want to promote you. They might want to give you more resources. They might want to sponsor your efforts. So it's a great way for you to 
build those connections. And I know a lot of people sometimes are worried about being really heads down or not communicating with their colleagues one-on-one. -on -one. So another easy hack is to start just speaking amongst your colleagues and making sure you guys are like doing those lunch and learn sections. Now another thing is networking. How many of you like networking? Oh, okay, like a handful of you. The There's rest always of you, a few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Only a few. The, the rest of you are in my camp. I, I, I have to admit, I, I hate networking. As you can tell, I'm pretty short. So when I first moved to the Bay Area in 2004, I would go to these networking events because I was like, you know, I just moved from the East Coast. I need to build a network. It's important for my professional development. But I did not enjoy going to these events, you know, because clearly people are taller than me. I can't maintain eye contact. I didn't really want to grab a drink and sit at the bar. But I, I knew it was important to develop these relationships. So I started thinking, you know, how can I do this networking, but in a way that resonates with me? And so I thought about speaking at the events instead. And so I'd sign up to speak at a local code camp or a meetup, just something short, you know, a lightning talk. And it was great because afterwards, people would come up to me, they would ask me questions, we'd have deeper conversations, and the relationship sort of naturally evolved. So for me, it was a more authentic way to network. And for those of you who didn't raise your hands, right, consider speaking as a way to hack networking. And then, of course, hiring, right? A lot of times people say, well, will it really help with hiring? And I know you guys are growing here at Logitech. And what I've discovered for every startup that I've worked at and represented is that anytime I get up to speak, whether it's a simple product demo, talking about our technology stack, even going on college campuses, the people who are attending often feel like it's a great way to connect with a potential team member, to connect with somebody that they're going to work with. And so they often find that it's much more helpful, it's much more authentic, and it can be a great way to aid your recruiters. So consider public speaking as a way to attract more great talent. All right, but you're probably thinking that's all fine and dandy, but I am so nervous. How can I get over my nerves or how can I learn to manage them so that I can get up and speak? And Karen's going to share a couple of strategies around managing those nerves. Okay, so show of hands, how many people feel that they get stage fright, they get the nerves? <laughs> Usually most people's hands go up at this point. No kidding. We've been there ourselves. In fact, we heard a joke by Jerry Seinfeld not too long ago that most people would rather be in the grave than giving the eulogy. <laughs> kind of true, right? So we get it. We've been there ourselves. And in our book, we have a number of strategies for getting over stage fright that you can try out. But I'll share two of them today to give you a taste of it. And the first technique is something we call power posing. Now, you may have heard of power posing because Amy Cuddy, who is a professor at Harvard, gave a great TED talk about this. And you can go watch it afterwards if you want to watch more. But in a nutshell, what Amy Cuddy and a few other researchers started exploring was, hey, let's look at athletes and what happens when an athlete is on top of their game. When they've scored a goal, won a race, or done something significant, they tend to put their arms up in a victory sign, right? And this is universal around the world because we see it throughout the Olympics. It doesn't change by gender. Men and women do it. And we even see it across ages. We see it at World Cup soccer matches, and we see it at AYSO neighborhood little kids playing soccer as well, right? When those little kids score a goal, they are running down the field like this. It's just human nature that when we feel on top of our game and confident in our abilities, we make ourselves really big. And what Amy Cuddy and the research that they started looking into was like, hey, I wonder if we can fake our bodies into thinking we are on top of our game, that we're confident, powerful, and stronger than we're feeling by striking an expansive, powerful pose and see what happens. And what they found out is actually, yes, you can fake your bodies into thinking you're more powerful than maybe you're feeling by striking this power pose for two minutes. And in two minutes, two things happen. The first is that our bodies create more testosterone, which makes us feel powerful and confident. And our bodies also lower the amount of cortisol that we have. And cortisol is the hormone that makes us anxious, stressed out, maybe a little nervous, right? 
So more confidence, less stressed out. It's like the perfect combination before we go on stage to give a talk, right? And we teach public speaking a lot online. We teach workshops and so forth. And this picture is um, from the Grace Hopper celebration, which is this huge conference for women in tech um, about a year and a half ago. And we taught hundreds and hundreds of women public speaking and power posing as well. And they so enjoyed getting up and power posing that we actually want all of you to get out of your seats now and stand up and power pose with us. And for those of you on Zoom, I, I, I want you uh, out of your seats too, wherever you can. And if you can't get out of a seat, just strike a power pose with your arms or make yourself bigger. And it feels good, doesn't it, to put your arms up in that victory sign? You can also mix it up by doing something like the Wonder Woman pose that Pornim is showing us right now. Okay, put your hands on your hips and just make your shoulders big. Or if maybe a bodybuilding pose kind of fit, fits your need of being big and strong, that's okay too. Yeah, okay. It doesn't matter what the pose is, as long as you are making your body bigger than it normally is, more expansive. Okay, does that feel good? Yeah, okay, you can all sit down. We won't do it for two minutes. But two minutes is the key. Now, since Amy Cuddy did her TED Talk and published this research, the research actually has come under scrutiny. And people are asking, does that chemical reaction actually happen? Was the sample size big enough? You know, it's being, it's being questioned. Well, we actually don't even care about the research being questioned because power posing works for us. Now, I mentioned that I have given a TED, TEDx talk, and this was about three years ago, and I had been doing more public speaking leading up to this TEDx talk. However, and I was getting more comfortable. However, this TEDx talk was a big deal, and my nerves were big as a result. I got nervous when I was even thinking about the outline for my talk and what my message wanted, was going to be. I got nervous when I was just creating my slides and practicing by myself. I got super nervous when I started giving a sort of a trial run of my talk to get feedback from some friends. Super, super nervous. And I kind of thought, like, what am I going to do? I am not going to be able to give this talk. I am so nervous. But fortunately, I saw Amy Cuddy's talk before I, you know, a few weeks before I gave mine. And I said, OK, I'm going to give that power posing a try because I don't know what else to do. So I power posed for two minutes in my hotel room before my talk that day. And I have to tell you, you feel ridiculous doing this for two minutes all by yourself. And you have to set the timer on your phone to make sure you do it for two minutes. But for two minutes, I did it. You mix it up. Um, and then I found a quiet place backstage just before I went out to give my talk. And I power posed back there. And there were some organizers back there who were kind of giving me funny glances as I'm standing back there behind the stage like this. But I didn't care. I power posed again for two minutes. And then guess what? When I walked out to give my talk, no nerves at all. It was a huge audience, and I just, I, I loved it. I loved being on stage. It felt great, and I couldn't believe it. It was an, an enjoyable experience. So that's why I am a huge fan of power, of, of power posing. It, like, it was a turning point for me in, in public speaking. So Pornima, by contrast, though, had a slightly different experience when she gave a TEDx talk. Yeah, so much like Karen, uh, I also signed up to give a TEDx talk in 2014. And as I told all of you, I've been speaking for a very long time, so I don't tend to get as nervous. You know, I've done a lot of different talks. I've been a guest lecturer, and I was pretty confident going into my talk. I still practiced, so I practiced by myself, felt great. I practiced with friends and family, felt great. And then I remember flying out to the East Coast where I was going to give my talk. And the day of, you know, I woke up and people were coming up to me and they were asking me, like, are you nervous? How are you doing? And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm ready to give this talk. And then they called my name to walk up onto the stage. So I started walking onto the stage. And as I was walking onto that stage, my knees started shaking. And I didn't know what was going on. So I just kept walking until I got to that red circle and I stopped, but my knees, they wouldn't stop shaking. And I realized in that moment what was going on. I had stage fright. So I took a couple deep breaths, and I started my talk, and I got through it. 
But I did not feel good. My husband came up to me and he said, good job, great talk. I was like, are you, are you kidding? Like, didn't you see my knees? They were so shaky the whole time. I was like, no, your, your knees were fine. You, you did a really good job. And I was like, you know what? You're just saying that because you're my husband and you have to be supportive. So I kind of dismissed him and walked into the audience. And of course, all these strangers are coming up to me and saying, you know, good job, great talk. And I said, okay, strangers wouldn't lie. About a month later, I watched the talk on the YouTube channel. And sure enough, I had done a pretty good job. My knees weren't shaky. It had all been in my head. But I never wanted to feel that way again. I never wanted to feel like I wasn't connected to the audience, that I was trying to rush through it, and that I just felt like I was in panic mode the whole time. So I remember telling Karen about my experience. And she asked me, well, did you power pose? I was like, no, what's that? She was like, oh, you know, it's when you put your hands up in a V sign or do an expansive posture for about two minutes. And I said, OK, you know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. If it worked for you, it could work for me. And I remember how nervous she was. So I thought, OK, it's got to work wonders. So the next time I did a high stakes talk, I tried it out. It really helped. And pretty much ever since, I've been doing it. I've, I even do it before you know, some difficult conversations with colleagues or friends or my spouse. And I find that it really helps. We have even heard from our readers that sometimes they'll do it with their kids. Uh, so give it a shot, try it in a lot of situations, and see how it could benefit you. Yeah. So we're going to move on from power posing now. And I said I was going to share two techniques for getting over stage fright. So here's number two. And it's something we call meet and greet. This picture is from a conference I attended earlier this year at the University of Nebraska. I think that was it. No, actually, uh, Indiana University. That's where it was. And at, as you can see, I am saying hello to other people who have come to get a seat at the, at the dinner. It was a dinner keynote I was giving. And saying hi, exchanging some small talk, maybe finding out what they were studying, where they came from, and so forth. And this is so much better to do, to go out and meet and greet the other early birds than what I used to do, to, and, and didn't help with stage fright at all. What I used to do was I would arrive somewhere early, I would set up my laptop, I would get mic'd, and then I would pull out my smartphone and go find a quiet corner and like start checking my messages and kind of ignoring the fact that I was about to give a talk because I was so nervous and I just wanted to escape from the situation. But look what happens to my shoulders when I am checking my mail or my messages on a phone, right? They go in because it's, the screen's small. And that's undoing all that great power posing that I had just done, right? So don't do that. Don't grab your phone and check your messages before you give a talk for that reason. Stay expansive. But also, we could get an important message from our team at work saying, you know, huge emergency. We need you to dial into a meeting right away, right? You don't need that stress before you're about to give a talk. And if you have kids that are school-aged, you might get a message from the school saying, hey, can you come in for an important parent-teacher meeting tomorrow? We really need to talk to you about something, right? You don't need that stress. So put the phone away and go out and meet and greet the other people who are coming in to, say, you know, to hear your talk and getting seats. Um, and it doesn't have to be much, a little something about like, what's your name, what, or, you know, where did you go to school, or what do you do, and maybe a little bit about your content too, your topic and what they want to hear about it. You stay busy, and not only do you stay busy, but you make some friends in the audience so that as you look at them when you're giving your talk, they're shaking their head and agreeing with you, which I really appreciate because it makes me more confident as a result. <laughs> so there are all these benefits to meeting and greeting before you give your talk. So give that a try the next time you're giving a talk as well. So let's move on from, uh, from stage fright to the next topic. So a lot of times people feel pretty good. They feel like, OK, I have some tools that I can manage the nerves. But then they end up asking themselves this question. You know, why would anybody care about what I have to say? I'm not exactly an expert, or I'm new to a role, or I'm new in my career. So why would anybody care about what I have to share? It's not exactly earth shattering, right? Well, here's the thing. People are coming out to hear you speak because they want to know what's your experience and your perspective on a particular topic. Otherwise, they would just sit at home, you know, watch a video, read a book, or do a Google search, right? So they're coming out to connect with you and learn what did you go through. Now, the other thing is that there's always somebody out there who's just a little bit more new than you are, right? They might be more of a beginner. 
And when you share what you went through, you end up giving them a lot of great shortcuts and techniques that help them fast track their learning. So even if it took you six months or six years or however long to solve a problem, put a process or you know, learn a new framework, you can share what you wish you had learned and how you wish you could change things. And that's gonna help them move a lot quicker. Now, of course, there are times where people feel embarrassed. They're like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna share that it took me six years to learn you know, Java. That's just that's too embarrassing, right? So how can I you know, connect with the audience? Well, the truth is people wanna know what those failures are, right? That's actually going to, again, help them connect with you. They see that you're human, and that's really what they're coming out to hear. They don't wanna get all the sugar-coated stories. So as much as you might feel like you don't wanna share those mistakes, realize that's what people wanna hear. Now, a lot of times people say, okay, but how do I know what my expertise is? I, I don't know, there's a lot of people talking about the same topics that I would be interested in. And what we recommend is that you actually take stock of all the projects you've worked on for the last three to 12 months. And this is what we like to call the inventory method, because you're taking stock. And as you take stock, you'll see that themes emerge. And the reason that we say three to 12 is because it's usually what's freshest in your mind. And because we're in tech and things move pretty quickly, right? It's also what's most relevant. And as you do this, you'll start to get a sense of what a topic could be that you could speak on. And even if it's one that other people have done before, it's okay because you get to put your expertise and your perspective as the spin on it. So to give you a simple example, back in 2008, when I was the founding engineer at mint.com, I decided to sign up to speak at a local code camp. I didn't even have a topic in mind. I just sort of signed up because I was eager. And then I went back to my team. I was like, I need, I need to come up with a topic. What should I talk about? And so they, somebody recommended that I kind of take stock of what I had done. So as I did the inventory method, I realized that what I had done in the last three to 12 months was I had built the prototype, I had launched it, and I had scaled it to serving millions of people. So that's what I started to talk about. And it turns out it really resonated with the audience because a lot of people in the audience had built a prototype, but they hadn't yet launched it. It was still you know, sitting on their computer or other people maybe had worked on a particular part of a product, but they hadn't seen it from inception to scaling. And so that was great to see that whole spectrum of the experience that I had. Now, there was one other benefit that I didn't even know at the time to me sharing my experience with this audience. And it wasn't until last year when Karen and I were giving this same talk that a young woman in the audience came up to me afterwards and she said, yeah, that talk that you gave back in 2008 at that code camp, I was at that talk. And I thought if you could join a startup being a couple years out of school, that I could too. And I did. And my company also got acquired. So my little talk at a local code camp, you know, where I was kind of getting up there to speak, ended up showing somebody an opportunity that they might not have considered before and really changing the course of their career. So remember that you know, while you might think, oh, is this making an impact or not, any talk that you give is going to influence and inspire somebody. You never know maybe when you find out that impact. Okay, so now you're probably thinking, well, that's great, but like, how do I make sure people actually show up and I'm talking in a way that's relevant? So what we recommend is, much like you create a user persona when you're creating a product, right, that says, Who's the product for? You know, what does it do? What are some use cases? You want to do the same thing for your talk. And we like to call this the audience persona. And if you're not sure who's going to be there, you can contact the organizer of the conference or the event to get a little bit more detail. You know, ask them questions like, what level are these people at? What are their job functions? What companies are they coming from? Maybe what's the theme of the event, if there is one. And then from there, you can craft a summary. Now, there's a couple ways you can craft this summary. The first is you could have it be based on some prerequisites or some experience level. So to give you a simple example of how that would look, let's say I'm doing a talk on iOS development. I might say something like, you know, this talk is for people who know how to program but are new to programming in iOS and using Objective-C. I'm gonna show you how you can build your first application. Now, if people are a little bit more advanced, I might change the summary and I might say something like, this talk is for people who have already built an application 
they're looking to use the new SWIFT framework and speed up development, right? So when I put it this way, the people who are beginners are going to come to the beginner talk. I'm not going to have advanced people coming, feeling bored or heckling me. And similarly, for the advanced talk, I'm not going to have beginners come out and feel like, oh my gosh, this is so over my head and I'm overwhelmed, right? I'm going to get the right people in the audience. But it doesn't always have to be on experience level. It could also be based on a scenario. So another example would be, you know, this talk is for people who are looking to get a four or a five star rating in the app store. I'm going to share the three best practices for getting these high reviews and avoiding those, you know, low star reviews. So now you're going to get people who have maybe built an app, maybe they're not getting good, great reviews, or they're about to launch and they want to make sure they get those great reviews, right? So think about how you would craft the summary to attract your audience. And then, of course, people will show up and you're probably thinking, okay, but how do I, how do I get them to stay excited and hooked from the first moment? So Karen's going to share some techniques around how to start with the story. Yeah, so storytelling is a big theme in public speaking. And we firmly believe that you should, we should learn from traditional literature, from stories, like think about a book you might open that starts with the words, it was a dark and stormy night. When we read those words, we might get a little curious about what's going to happen next. And if we were in the story, would we be outside getting cold and wet or inside next to a fireplace, maybe with a warm drink? And what's going to happen to the protagonist when he or she is introduced? And why is it even important that to the whole storyline that it's dark and stormy outside, right? We get curious and we want more. And we believe you can do the same type of technique to a tech talk, that you can start any tech talk with the equivalent of it was a dark and stormy night. And I'm going to share two examples of what this might look like. For each example, I'm going to do kind of a before, and I'll stand over here and I'll do the after. The before, I'm going to sh show you how I would start a talk starting with an agenda. I show of hands, how many of you tend to start your talks with, here's the agenda, here are all the things I'm going to cover in my talk, and then you launch into it? Most of us. I learned that technique when I was first giving talks. It's like, tell them what you're going to tell them, your agenda. Tell them, and then tell them what you told them, right? Summarize. It's a really nice, simple format, OK? So I'm going to show you what an agenda-driven start might look like, and then I'm going to contrast it with a story-driven start, OK? I'm going, to do, I'm going to do it twice. The first one is going to be an in real life thing that happened, You know, something that really happened that we're talking about, and that's the context of all of this. So here's the before my agenda. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Catlin. And in my talk today, I'm going to share three best practices for handling a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS, on your website. Let's go. Okay. So that's my agenda. It's clear. You know what I'm going to cover, those three best practices, right? But let's contrast that with starting with a story. Six months ago, we were under attack. Our website was experiencing a distributed denial of service attack, a DDoS, and it was our first one ever, and we didn't know what to do. Well, I'm Karen Catlin, and in my talk today, I'm going to tell you about the three things that we wish we had known that night. Let's go. Okay. Small little tweak, but everyone's you're shaking your head. So it's more engaging. You're a little curious. You start thinking, well, what if I were that person working on that DDoS? How, what would I want to know, right? We get engaged. Okay. Now, sometimes we don't have a in real life story, or maybe we have a customer story that we need to sort of, you know, make anonymous or what, whatever's going on. It's okay to come up with a hypothetical scenario. So that's going to be story number two. Example number two is hypothetical. So again, I'm going to stand here and do my agenda driven the old fashioned way. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Catlin. And in my talk today, I'm going to tell you about how to set up your first GitHub account and populate it in less than an hour. Okay? Again, you know what you're going to cover. I'm going to cover, right? It's really clear. But contrast that with a hypothetical story. And these hypothetical stories often start with the word imagine. Okay? Imagine you are applying for your first tech internship and you're filling out the application process. And it asks for your GitHub account, but you don't have one, and you are meeting with a recruiter in less than an hour. 
Well, I'm Karen Catlin, and in my talk today, I'm going to share how to set up that GitHub account, populate it with some school projects, and be all ready for that recruiter meeting. Let's go. Okay. Small little tweak to start your story, uh, start your talk with a story, but also look for opportunities to reflect back and refer back to that story throughout your talk. Like the one with the DDoS, you know, maybe about halfway through, you can say, well, at this point, it was 2 a.m. We had raided the, the kitchen of all the snacks. Nothing was left. And then this happened, right? And so you, you kind of layer on some additional detail to re-engage your audience with that original storyline. It, it's, it's a very simple technique, but we have to um, learn how to do it and practice it. And it's just magic when we can do it. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. So hopefully now you're feeling pretty good and you know, willing to go through a talk. Now, we hear from a lot of re our readers that say, you know, it's great, I can get through my talk, but then at the very end, my nerves flare up again because q and I'm like, oh, q and A, that's like a piece of cake. People just ask you questions and you answer them, right? Like, no, someone might ask me a question I don't know the answer to, or the audience is really quiet because they're nervous. No one wants to ask the first question. I'm just kind of standing there you know, waiting for someone to ask the first question and I'm looking really nervous. So we have a couple of techniques around how to handle each of these scenarios. Let's start with the first, where you might get asked a question that you don't know the answer to, right? And this is totally normal. You know, you're not expected to be an expert on a topic. So it's okay to say, hey, I don't know the answer to this person's question. Does anybody else here in the audience know the answer? Right? We like to call this the crowd source strategy because you're sourcing an answer from the crowd. Sometimes somebody in the audience may know the answer. If no one knows, it's okay to say, okay, come up to me afterwards. We'll do some research. We'll figure out what the solution is, right? But you appear more authentic as a presenter and you know, not like a know-it-all. Now, the other case where you are waiting for someone to ask the first question, right? A great way to break the ice is to go back to that meet and greet technique that Karen shared, right? Where you're going out into the audience, you are meeting people, maybe you meet somebody, let's say her name is Sally. Sally's got a great question that you think could apply to the audience. You might strike a deal with Sally and say, hey, when I start q and do you mind if I start with your question first and then answer other people's questions? And if Sally says, okay, then when you get started in Q&A, just to warm up the audience, you might say something like, I know you guys are all eager to start asking questions, I'm going to first start with Sally's, and then once I'm done, I'm happy to take your questions, right? So this helps break the ice with the audience. They see that someone else had asked a question, got a little shout out. It's safe to ask questions. There's no like you know, stupid questions. Or if you're in one of those big conference rooms where people have to line up, it also gives them time to line up to the mic. So it's a great way to start engaging your audience and warming them up to that Q&A and you don't have to stand there and wait for someone to ask the question. So try these out the next time you're doing a Q&A. All right. Now, we said we would share some of our war stories, right, so that you see we've been through the trenches. We're still up here presenting in front of you. Now, my worst talk ever was now, thankfully, two years ago. When we wrote the book, it was like six months or something. So it's been two years. And at the time, I was an entrepreneur in residence at 500 Startups, the accelerator in Mountain View. And at the beginning of the week, uh, myself and a colleague had been talking about a way we could improve the process around managing all the companies that we had each quarter. And afterwards, he suggested that I put together a presentation and pitch it at the upcoming retreat. So I agreed to do it because I knew I had some time on my hands. But then I had one of those weeks, maybe, maybe you've had one of those weeks, maybe you're going through one of those weeks where you're just so heads down, you've got a million things going on, and just, you, know, you end up dropping the ball. So when my colleague came up to me later in the week and asked me if I was ready, sort of lied, and I said, yeah, it's, it's totally ready. I, I'm ready to pitch at the retreat tomorrow. And then I kind of rushed over to the organizer, and I was like, hey, I, I need a time spot. I've got to pitch this idea at the retreat tomorrow. And the organizer was like, yeah, sure, uh, let me see. OK, there's a one 15-minute spot. It's right before lunch, and I need your slides you know, right away. And in my head, I was thinking, oh, oh, right away. OK, I mean, I'm not going to have time to practice. I'm not going to have time to run through my slides or think of questions. 
But then I thought, you know what? Come on, I am a public speaking pro. I can do this. So I kind of rushed over to my desk, threw some slides together, sent it over to the organizer, and I was like, yeah, I, I got this. Not a problem. I can wing this talk. And the next day, it was my turn to speak. The organizer called me up, and I started walking up to give my talk. And I saw my slides show up, and they were a huge mess because I had used one of those spiffy web fonts. It was called Cool Vetica, and I forgot to give the fonts to the organizer. So when my slides showed up, they were just all garbled. And of course, I hadn't tested it because I was winging my talk, and you know, I was this public speaking pro. So I spent the first five minutes of my 15-minute talk fixing the slides so that they would look legible. And then I launched into my talk. And at the end of it, I just looked and saw all these faces that looked really quizzical. And I thought, oh gosh, Q&A is going to be pretty tough. So I took a couple of questions initially. And then I, I realized like I can't just keep crowdsourcing this and saying I don't know. So I stopped mid midway through the Q&A. And I said, you know what? I'm really sorry, guys. You know, I didn't practice this talk. I didn't think through the questions. And I don't want to waste your time. It's right before lunch. You're probably all hungry to get on to lunch. So if it's OK with you, I'm going to just practice this and do it at a later date. Thankfully, I was in a very kind setting where my colleagues were like, yeah, this is definitely not your best work. You know, we, we always expect more from you. But it's OK. Everybody gets a hall pass. And in my head, I was thinking, oh, I'm really lucky because I did this with some peers. Imagine if I had did this in front of a high stakes talk and I just would have crashed. And so public speaking pro or not, I learned my lesson. I was going to always follow my process, you know, test my slides, practice it, and never wing another talk again. So that is my worst experience. Karen, do you want to share yours? Yeah. When Pornima and I were planning this talk that we're giving you now, I joked with her, it's like, oh, I'm a little bit of an overachiever. So my worst talk ever was kind of a whole genre of talks. And pretty much every talk I ever gave in that first career, that 25 years of building software products, were my worst talks ever. And the reason they were so bad is because of this. This is how I used to create slides. I'd open my company's PowerPoint template. I'd make an agenda slide. And then for each major concept, I'd make a slide with a list of bullets for each point I wanted to make. And then I'd edit the words and phrases to be shorter and play with the typeface size so everything would fit on my screen. And then my slides served as my crutch. And I'd read each point and not miss a thing. OK. Show of hands, how many of you create <laughs> slides like this? Yeah, there's always yeah, many of us. I know. And Look what happens when we create slides like this. First of all, I wasn't even looking at you. You're looking at my back, maybe, and reading along with me. You're not engaged with anything I'm saying. You are reading to get the points, right? You're not even, you don't even need me here. You're not listening to me at all. And so um, we, I fortunately have since realized how to not be doing this. And instead, as you can see from our talk today, we love visuals. Whenever we can, we use a visual to represent the key point we're trying to make. We put just a little bit of text across the top to help orient ourselves about the point, but also let the audience, in case they tune out a little bit, they can look at that little bit of text to know what, where we are, what we're talking about. And it is so much more engaging. We also hear, uh, and I know many of you are probably thinking, that I can't just use visuals in a talk here at Logitech. It wouldn't go over. I've got engineering concepts to teach. I've got data, graphs, other things. And we get it. But if you are going to use text on your slide, keep in mind something that we've learned, which is the five by five rule. And if you're going to have bullets, five, lists, five bullets max, no more, and only five words per bullet. And by doing that, you force yourself to be super crisp. And it's hard. I, I, when we teach, I, tr I try to do that too. It's hard. But it's crisp. And then the audience can just skim it and listen to you instead. And of course, if you have a lot of data and graphs, just keep it as simple as you can and minimize the, the noise and really just highlight the data and the trends and whatever that might be that you're trying to uh, portray. Um, so anyway, don't, don't make this mistake. <laughs> anyway, so let's wrap it up. Yeah. So we've shared with you a few strategies from our book, the most popular ones, but you have copies of the book so that you can go through more advanced ones. 
we started by talking about why it's important to your career, how it can help your company as well when it comes to recruiting. And then we shared a couple techniques around managing those nerves in case that's what's holding you back. Who remembers one of the two techniques for managing your nerves? Power pose, yes. Who remembers the second? Meet and greet, yes, perfect. And then we said, okay, but a lot of times we worry, even if we can manage the nerves, that who would want to listen to us? We're not exactly experts. We're new in a role. We're new in, a, in our career, right? And so I shared the inventory method and how you can extract your expertise. Who remembers how the inventory method works? Yep, take, take stock of your experiences. Yep, in the last three to 12 months, usually freshest in your mind and most relevant. And then we talked about creating an audience persona, much like you create a user persona to create a summary. And then Karen shared a couple of techniques around storytelling. Who remembers one of the two techniques for storytelling? Imagine. OK, I heard somebody say imagine. So coming up with a hypothetical. And then what was the other case? Start with a story, story. sure. But there's kind of two types of stories you can tell. Personal. Yeah, Personal. if you have it in real life and, and it's it's not proprietary and you can share it. Exactly. And then, of course, I shared our worst talks ever so that you see we've been through the trenches. We have been, we've embarrassed ourselves, but we are putting down the past and moving forward. So if you have had a talk that you've given that maybe caused you to say, I hate public speaking, I'm never doing it again, put it in the past, no need to dwell on it. And now try implementing some of our strategies the next time you're speaking, whether it's you know, even in a meeting, one-on-one -on -one conversation, or if you decide to give a bigger talk. All right, so before we go to Q&A, just want to let you guys know that if you didn't get a soft cover, you can also take a picture of this and download a free copy of the ebook as well as the audio book. All right, and if you missed that, we'll send it over to uh, Olivia or Jessica and make sure you get that as well. All right. So with that, let's open it up for any questions that you guys might have. Yeah, so you're in the front, and then I'll take you in the back. Oh, we've got Mike. Yeah. Uh, I don't have my reading glasses. Oh, it's on. Yeah. I have the same problem. Reading glasses. Reading glasses. I don't know. I've got a loud got voice. So oh, okay. Just, just yeah, go ahead, and then we'll repeat it. So uh, when you're power closing, what is in your mind? Because I'm trying to understand whether it's a relaxation technique, whether it's like meditating, you know, mm -hmm. because if you power pose and your mind is going like a hamster wheel, then, you know, it uh, defeats the purpose, doesn't it? I think it depends on what is going to meet your needs in terms of what you should be thinking of. I, um, I actually will, will do the power posing and actually think a little bit like I am awesome. Like I have to have a pep talk with myself, okay? I am awesome, I've got this, I've practiced. I can't wait to get the reaction from the, from the audience on my talk. So that's what I do. If meditation is going to be better and serve you well, go with that. So practice it and see which one works best, best for you. Yeah, good question. In the book, we do recommend doing some breathing techniques as well, so that helps. Yeah. I'm gonna take in the back and then in, in the front. Red. Yeah. Do you mind helping? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for the talk, but my question is, uh, how you do the rehearsal? How, how do you practice? How do we practice a talk? Yeah, handle so it? we have kind of various levels that we recommend practicing. The first is actually starting with an outline, because a lot of times people will write out a script, and it's not good because then you end up memorizing it and hanging on to every single word or trying to think about it or recollect it versus being in the audience. So creating a general outline, speaking from that outline, kind of re organizing it if you think that it doesn't fit. And then when you get ready to uh, speak it out loud, right? Because sometimes people practice it in their head, and again, that's not helpful. So speak it out loud. And once you get a little bit comfortable with that, you can record yourself using a camera. And when you watch yourself, again, do things like turn off the audio and just watch for gestures to see if you're doing this too much or if you're doing anything that's crazy. Uh, then you can turn off the, audio, uh, the video and just listen to the audio to see if there's some verbal tics like ums or uhs. And then one last time, you know, you put it together, see if the content makes sense. You can even share it with other people, especially if your colleagues are busy. You might say, hey, just watch this video, send me some feedback, you know, good and the bad, and what to add or what to remove. And then 
to take it up a notch, like if it's a high stakes talk, we do recommend that you try to emulate it, uh, the scenario as much as possible. So if you're gonna go and be on stage, then ask the organizer of the event, hey, can I show up early? Can I do a dress rehearsal? Can I walk through all my slides? Can I get mic'd up? Can I see the bright lights? Because once you are in that environment, it really helps you to quell your nerves because you know what it's going to be like, right? And if you can't do that, then maybe put together an audience at work or at home and practice with them so that you get more comfortable presenting in front of people. So that's typically how we recommend that you practice. And I want to emphasize one thing Pornima said there is don't practice just in your head. Yeah. Because if you run through it in your head, you're going to sound awesome, awesome, awesome every time. You don't make mistakes when you're when it's all up here. You sound amazing. But when you say it out loud, even if you're just like I tend to like to go for walks around my neighborhood and, and practice my talks. I say it out loud because I catch myself like, ooh, that didn't really sound that right. And what was the word I was really trying to use there? In my head, I'm awesome, but I, I notice it all and I can correct. Um, and by the way, my kids have told me, they've coached me, mom, when you're out walking around the neighborhood, when in your practice and your talks out loud, can you put your earbuds in so people think you're on a call? Because <laughs> otherwise we're gonna get calls that mom's a little crazy over here. So that's what I do. I, I put my earbuds in and pretend I'm talking on the phone. Right. Yeah, did you have a follow up? Yeah. yeah. Also, how do you prepare for the, the question? My question? Oh, how do we prepare for the questions? Mm, yeah. So, one thing, when, as Pornima mentioned, it's great to do a trial run with some friends or peers, you know, at work or something. And not only does that trial run help you get comfortable with the material, but you can also ask for feedback like, does it all make sense? What else should I emphasize? You can also ask, what questions do you think I'm going to get, right? Because, and have them write those down. And those questions don't mean you should take those questions and try to work the answers into your talk, but those questions are then your practice of making sure you're prepared to answer some of those questions. So can you imagine doing that? Would that help you with, with uh, being more prepared for Q&A? jump on me, so I have to prepare for every single question. Yeah. It's also good to have those in your Q&A because it makes it more interactive, right? Especially if you have a talk or maybe it's a limited time and you have to get through it. Uh, so depending on the format of the talk, it might be better to include it in Q&A. Don't feel like you need to put everything into your talk. Um, the other thing to think about is what were, because it, it might be a topic that you've worked on, right? So what were some thoughts that you had when you were early on in this project? And those might be questions that other people bring up. As you give the talk again and again, you'll notice that audiences tend to ask the same questions. So what we used to do when we gave this talk and a few others is we would like write down what people had asked because we knew it was going to come up again. And did we have like a crisp response or do we want to maybe even incorporate some of it into a talk or into like a blog post or something else? So it's helpful to, to do that. Yeah. Thanks for waiting, waiting patiently. Yeah. Where's the mic? Take, yeah. Oh. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. We'll repeat it. Um, how long does a power pose last? So, you do it <laughs> the effects. Before that, it's still okay. Yeah. And then another subsequent question is besides the, the, the power pose, do you warm up your voice as well? Mm. Yeah. So, how long does that power pose impact the, the effect of it last? And I hear it, maybe the research is very clear, but of course, the research is under scrutiny and everything. Um, I think doing it an hour before you're about to give a talk is probably ideal. Um, but I, as I explained in my TED talk, I did it in the morning and then again in uh, just an hour before. So I think closer is better, but it doesn't have to be right before. Um, so anyway, and then I've already forgotten the second the question. The voice. The How voice. do you warm up your voice? Do you, do you have techniques there? I, I could go. Yeah, I don't typically, because I am usually somebody that projects and I've gotten really <laughs> used to it. And I'm usually speaking on a, not necessarily daily basis, but a weekly basis, so I don't have a lot. However, we have one technique that we love called the pen exercise, and what you do is you put it between your uh, teeth, like this, and you read from a book so that it helps you enunciate, it helps you kind of open up your cheek muscles. If some, if some of you might struggle with a nervous stutter or you're worried about coming out clearly, you know, the words, if it's a second language, if English is your second language, you can try this pen uh, exercise. It's in the book as well. But that's one way to kind of warm up your voice, warm up your muscles, uh, and doing it, 
you know, not necessarily every day, but doing it kind of periodically for about five to 15 minutes is a good exercise. Yeah. yeah. In the back, go ahead. What are your tips for um, recovering if you experience something like un unexpected? So technical difficulties, you kind of lose your train of thought, or if the audience is just distracted or unengaged? Yeah. Yeah, it's ha ha all of that has happened to us in spades before. Yeah. And um, I think that in general, you have to sort of assume that there's something is going to go wrong. Things happen, right? So you can run through different scenarios and try to be prepared. But for example, if your slides just aren't going to show up, like there's some problem with the projector or something like that, then we, ha in the, and in the book we share this, we, ex we recommend you run through your whole talk without your slides so that you could give it in case that happens, you know, without, you can give the talk without your slides. Um, we've had, we've, we've taught before when the fire alarm has gone off. And guess what? When you're at the front of the room, you are the leader. And people are looking to you, even if you're the guest at that company, people are looking to you like, what do we do? The fire alarm's on. So you have to just like, okay, fire alarm, everyone exit over here. And you just like take charge and just like move people out. Um, literally, that's what happens. Um, we have, I have forgotten my, my next train of thought completely. Um, it happened when we were giving this talk about a year and a half ago, yeah. I think, um, at the Palo Alto Lean In yeah. Circle, um, which is about 80 or 90 women were there um, for this Lean In Circle. And we were giving our talk. And it was my turn to do that storytelling where I'm over here and over here. And I started to do the first, here's the first the first um, scenario. And I completely forgot it was a DDoS attack. My mind was blank. Fortunately, I had Pornima right there. I'm like, Pornima, what was the story I was going to share? And she's like, security, security. And I'm like, oh, yeah. And that was enough. If you don't have a Pornima <laughs> next to you and you think you're going to hit that kind of situation, it's OK to have notes over here on a, on a kiosk, on a, a lectern or something, and say, I just lost my train of thought. Hold on, I want to make sure I'm covering everything. And then you can look. And you can have an outline there. The audience will give you a break. You don't have to be absolutely perfect, right? So hopefully those, those techniques help you. Yeah. yeah, think about some of these things. Hi, so uh, Pernima, you gave the example of your, your worst, um, uh, I guess, example of doing a speech. And you said that you swore afterwards that you would always follow the process. Yeah. But, but what about those occasions when there, there isn't uh, an opportunity to have the process, when you're asked to give a, um, an impromptu speech, for example? Sure. A case in point uh, I can think of is um, maybe you're asked to uh, uh, speak to somebody that's being honored at uh, some event. And yeah. Somebody asks you to uh, say a few words and something like that, um, and where you don't have a chance to actually, uh, you know, put your, your speech together in your mind. You don't have the opportunity at that point to do your power pose, right? Uh, but how do you get comfortable doing an sure. impromptu speech? Well, hopefully it's not so rushed that they tell you like 30 seconds before you have to go on stage. But even if it is, I would, I would negotiate and say, hey, can I just have five minutes to run to the bathroom and like come back? So buy yourself a little bit of time and use that as an opportunity to maybe put down a quick outline. If you're introducing somebody, maybe you go up to them and you say, hey, can you just give me like three highlights in your life or career, whatever the context of the situation is, so that you can best represent them. And again, have that kind of outlined out. And then maybe take a couple minutes to do a quick you know, run through in your, in your head, but preferably you know, out loud. So even in those situations, I feel like just doing a little bit of prep work, you know, jotting those notes down, can be helpful and mostly avoid rambling uh, and keep to the time and make sure that what you're saying is succinct and gets the point across. So I, I find this is especially helpful in meetings for a lot of introverts who feel like they need time to think and process. So we tell them, hey, if something comes up in that meeting, maybe take down some notes and then at the end or even in the middle of the meeting, you know, ask to then speak and convey what you need because they necessarily can't think on their feet. Um, the other thing is practice makes perfect. So in that situation where you're presenting somebody that's new, you don't have their background, the information is certainly new to you. But if you've been kind of consistently speaking, then getting up and doing a new presentation isn't going to be a shocker. And there's going to be a lot of tools you have in your arsenal, whether it's great gestures, pauses, the manner in which you speak. 
so that even if you're just speaking for a little bit, it's going to come out clearly. Uh, and if it's a talk that you've given before and somebody asks you to like do something similar, you can kind of pull from that bank, you know, that kind of inventory and speak on that. So, so kind of think about what you've already got in your tool chest that you can use and it won't feel so daunting the next time you have to do it. TLDR, keep doing it, <laughs> right? You just have to, you have to just do it and get more comfortable with it if you want to be good at the, you know, impromptu kind of talks. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. We're yeah, we're okay staying. staying. If people need to leave, we yeah. understand, but go ahead. Yeah. So you guys uh, obviously seem very comfortable at public speaking and come across as total pros. Um, but I want to ask a question and at Adobe. And maybe Logitech's the same type of thing where once a year is like annual planning time and the new strategy is rolled out and you know everybody comes up with their plans for the year. Is that sort of the rhythm here too? Maybe, maybe it happens more frequently or less frequently. But once a year at Adobe when I was there, it was annual planning season. And I attended a senior leader meeting where the strategy was rolled out. And here were all these beautiful slides and it was rolled out. And then we were all told, now take this and communicate it to your staff. I'm like, okay, I can do that. I just saw this presentation. I got the slides. I could download them onto my laptop. And so I scheduled an all-hands meeting for probably 150 people to come and hear about the new strategy. And I did wing it. And I was, you know, I wasn't a good public speaker back then. I, I just was like, I'm going to wing it. I've got the slides. I'll just run through them. And I could tell that I was so boring. No one cared about this. They didn't get it. They asked these questions. I'm like, these are all good questions. I, I mean, I just, it was, it was a train wreck. And I couldn't recover at that point. Okay, I just had to power through it and, you know, try to answer the questions as best I could. I didn't know how to handle it. The next year, I was like, I'm not doing that to myself again. And I'm not doing that to the, the team either to have to listen to me. I decided to ditch the presentation that we had been given. You know, we sat there, we heard the big strategy presentation, we got the slides, and I'm like, I'm not even going to use them. And instead, I spent just a little bit of time to collect a couple of customer stories about, and it was really kind of those personas of, you know, um, imagine, and I think at the time it might have been American Eagle was trying to do this with their website, and blah, blah, blah. And I just sort of set the scenario up. And then there's this customer here who needs to do this, and this customer over here. And I said, and basically, we are going to be meeting their needs with a strategy moving forward. Any questions? OK. So, and I got feedback after that, too, from someone in, uh, in the audience. I remember the woman who, who came up to me afterwards and said, Karen, that was amazing. And have you taken some public speaking <laughs> classes since last year? And I just sort of smiled because I realized how bad I was and how, you know, so anyway, the lesson learned for me is I do not give someone else's talk ever anymore. Someone says, here's my talk. It's all set. Here's, the, here's all the talking points. Here's the slides. No way. I will make it my own, whether that's weaving in my own stories or starting from scratch. So um, hopefully that helps answer your question. Thank you. And I think there was one more question. Go ahead. Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I just had a question. Um, do you guys ever uh, get a little bit of anxiety before speaking? If so, like, how do you guys deal with it? Speaking from my own personal experience, like, um, I always get a little anxious. I get pretty anxious before I have to public speak because mm -hmm. I don't like doing it. Um, so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, still, we even after doing all the talks that we've done, and for me nowadays, it's more when I have to do a lightning talk, like a timed talk. If it's five or fifteen minutes, and there's going to be a buzzer that goes off because. I'm just trying to cram, you know, information. And the Ignite talks where yeah. it's like your slides, slides just automatically auto advance. advance. Yeah. It's, it's a pressure that's cooker. That's like a different, yeah, that's a different level. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, power posing certainly helps. Uh, another thing I found that really helps is my body. If I do open stances, if I'm sort of natural, then the audience feels comfortable, I feel comfortable, and then that timer that clock isn't what's on my mind and I'm not trying to rush through the talk or whatever I just I feel more uh, confident so uh, it's amazing how much you know you have in your control with your own body language like if you tend to be really scrunched or if you're kind of pacing around that just kind of reinforces your nerves so think about you know what you can control in your own sort of body maybe some breathing exercises certainly practice um, but each of those elements I think helps I'll also share with you, I'm a planner. Like I, when I go on vacation, I need my itinerary. Like everything needs to be planned, where we're staying, eating, and you know, all of that. I'm a, that's me. I don't know if this resonates with you or not. But so I get anxious, even though 
we are public speaking yeah. pros. Like, I get that anxiety you know, a month before I give a talk if I feel like I'm not yet prepared. It's happening right now. I'll tell you, I have to give a new talk. I've never given it before. It's at the end of September. And it's on a topic I, I'm still like trying to figure out what's my angle on this topic. It was kind of, the topic was suggested to me and I've never given a talk on this topic before. So I'm anxious and I'm waking up at three in the morning and thinking, oh my gosh, I really need to work on that outline. Like I need to start working on it because I'm losing sleep over it. Now, I know that I'll get through it, I'll prepare, I'll, I'll get my talk all nailed down. And the night before, I won't lose sleep because I'm prepared. So I just share that with you. It, it's, I think it's very natural. And, um, and if you are someone who needs to be prepared, like me, then prepare. And hopefully that will get rid of a lot of the anxiety leading up to it. Yeah. OK. So we are happy to stay a little bit longer if there are individual questions. But I want to thank everyone for coming out and staying uh, so much longer into your lunch hour, too. Yeah, thank you. I wish. That means I'd have lunch. a treat for me. For lunch. <laughs>